There's a father at a grocery store, and in the cart with him is a three-year-old boy who is inconsolable. He's losing it loudly. And as the father pushes him up and down the aisles, you can hear him saying, Calm down, Billy. We can do this, Billy. It's just a little longer, Billy. We'll, we'll be in the car in five minutes, Billy. We'll be home seeing Mama in 15 minutes, Billy. We can do this, Billy. Be a good boy, Billy. And another shopper, and an older woman, noticed all of this, and as she he was checking out, she sympathetically put her hand on his shoulder and said, I just have to commend you on how patient you were with your son, Billy. And the dad said, well, his name is Wesley. I'm Billy. No matter how much you love someone, there are going to be times when the relationship will need you to love higher and harder. And we're in this series that we have titled Anothering. Anothering is answering the call of Jesus to be his disciples by loving above the norm. You've heard me say that it's hard enough for me to live out the golden rule just to love other people like I want to be loved. But Jesus lays out for the disciples the platinum rule as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And this is job one for disciples. This is the first thing on the first day of class. This is the primary lesson. This is going to be on the final. Are you becoming a better anotherer? Because this is the leverage we have in the world. There is not a greater mission for us or a greater task than this. So we have to be on guard as disciples against what I would call anothering complacency. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, and he says, Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other, and in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. So, anotherers are always trying to love above their last attempt at anothering, or to put it another way, we are to never settle for a static love level. Now, remember, Nobody in the world should do love one another better than the followers of Jesus. In fact, nobody should be able to teach us about loving other people. Look again at what Paul said in verse 9 from the New Living Translation. But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. Now, how has God taught us? Well, God has taught us first by becoming flesh. Jesus Christ was love personified. You heard me say last time that if you ever want to know how to be obedient to God, if you ever want to know in a particular situation what God wants you to do, ask this question, what would love require? But another way to ask the same question is simply what would Jesus do? We don't need anybody else to teach us about love because we have the example and the teaching of Jesus. So God taught us how to love by becoming love in the flesh, and then he taught us by coming and indwelling us. He filled us with his love by filling us with his spirit. So now if the flesh says, strike back, the spirit within that we are learning to listen to, says, no, turn the other cheek. And when the flesh says, it's my coat, the Spirit says, 
Give that coat away and don't ask for it back. And when the flesh wants to respond to cursing with stronger cursing, that spirit within says, this is your moment to bless. You see, God is love. And the Bible says, we have now become partakers of the divine nature. So what does that mean? That means as Christians, we have a higher capacity to love than anybody else in the world because you are the partakers of the divine nature of God because God's very spirit is living in you. You have the capacity to excel at anothering. But a great capacity needs to be coupled with a great priority. We have to intend to become the anotherers we are capable of becoming. I told you last time that the Holy Spirit can enable you to love at a level you have never loved before. But the Holy Spirit will never make you love anybody more than you want to love them. So Paul says in verse 10, Indeed, you already show your love for all the believers throughout Macedonia. Even so, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you to love them even more. This is one of the reasons we gather in meetings just like this, so that we can encourage one another to love above where we have been loving. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Good anotherers are intentional, not accidental. Philip Yancey, in his great book, Disappointment with God, tells a very touching story. He was at his mother's house. Now his mother was widowed before Philip's first birthday, and they were looking through old photographs, and there was a picture of Philip about eight months old, and it was worn and bent and tattered. And there were a lot of pictures better than this one of him as a baby. And so he asked, he asked his mother, why have you kept this picture? And she explained that when Philip's father, as a young man of 24, contracted polio, the, the, the disease advanced quickly. And soon he was in what they called back then an iron lung and he spent the last four months of his life in that device, unable to move his head. And he had one request, that she would bring a picture of herself and of his two boys and cram them inside the knobs of that machine so he could spend his last days looking at the three people he cared and loved more than any other. And Philip realized that crumpled, tattered photo was the picture that his dad, whom he never knew, stared at every day until he died. And he said, I, I, I had a feeling that, that came back to me. The last time I had that same feeling was in a, a dorm room in college when I realized the God I never knew really, really did love me. And for the very first time, I realized so did my dad. Good anotherers are intentional. It does not happen by accident. So what are some concrete ways that we can love above where most people tend to settle? Well, let me give you some ideas. Just, just by reading through the, the rest of the book of, of 1 Thessalonians, Paul lays out four different ways that we can love above. And the first is this, to lift the hearts of the hurting. He's going to immediately raise a concern they have in Thessalonica of people who died. And the Thessalonian Christians thought that Jesus was coming back soon, and they were not anticipating people dying before Jesus returned. And one of their questions is, what will happen to believers who have died before the return of Christ? And, and what Paul does is he just preaches the gospel. 
I want you to look at the passage with me, with me at 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 13. Paul continues. He says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And isn't it interesting that the church never gets to a place where it does not need to hear the gospel? Every big question that we have faced, every fear we battle is answered by remembering Jesus died and rose again. So Paul preaches the gospel to them, and then he says in verse 18, therefore, encourage each other with these words. That's one way to love people. When they are given in to sorrow, when they are given in to grief and fear, you take the gospel to them and you encourage them. You see, love rejoices with people who rejoice. But love above will weep with people who are weeping. I've had this experience on many occasions where I go to the hospital and the first visit would be to a young couple like Austin and Miranda who just had a brand new beautiful baby boy and maybe the second visit would be to an older couple who has just learned that one of them has a disease that's terminal. Which visit is harder to make? Love rejoices with those that rejoice, and love above will go and weep with those who weep. Light, weight, loving does not go there. Light, weight, loving will always avoid situations where pain and grief can only be lessened by sharing it. But Jesus has called his disciples to heavy weight, loving. So how do you keep your love level from getting static? Well, one way, Paul says, is to, to lift the hearts of hurting people. You take some of their pain on yourself so that they will feel better. But a second way is this, to overwhelm your leaders with honor. Even if, even if it's hard... A very important principle for anothering is that authority is to be affirmed. In the workplace, as Christians, we give respect to those we work for. We respect those who are in government positions. Even if we don't agree with them, we always give them respect. This is something that I practice regularly when I am at the Capitol. I will call out a, a state representative or a state senator that I would be diametrically opposed to uh, many positions that they take, but I will always treat them with dignity and respect, and almost always I will have the opportunity to pray with them right there in the Capitol Rotunda with my hand on their shoulder. We respect those in authority in our homes and we respect those in the church that God has charged to be our leaders. Paul says in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians verses 12 and 13, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love. 
because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Hold them in the highest regard in love. By the way, I think there is a very strong connection to a culture of honor, to a culture of peace. Whenever you have a church with a, a lot of, of tension and division, almost always they will say that this is the issue. Almost always a culture of dishonor has been created. Paul says leadership is, is work. That is the word that he used. And a lot of us have no idea how much the leaders in the church give to their church. Every single Sunday, a deacon of this church or an elder of this church is giving a ride to someone to church. Every single Sunday, a deacon of this church or an elder of this church is taking communion to folks all across the city who are not able to be with us on Sunday mornings. Every Sunday that happens. And when they get with that individual, they pray with them, they read scripture to them, they serve communion to them, they sit and they visit with them every Sunday, every month. Your deacons and your elders gather in this building and we pray over spiritual concerns in our church. We pray by name over you every single month. In fact, a couple months ago, we prayed specifically for six people by name who have not yet been baptized in this church in the following month. Four of those six were baptized in one night. Praise God. Every month, we will leave our meeting here at the church as leaders and we go to the home of someone and we just pray over them. No agenda other than to encourage them and lift them up in prayer. And so much of what these men do, they don't trumpet, they don't tell you about. And, and listen, leaders cannot do their best when all they hear from those in the church is the worst. True story about Abraham Lincoln in the White House. This could never happen today, but back then it was possible to actually go up and visit the White House, just walk up to the doors and and have entry. And there was an older woman who asked if she could see the president, and for some reason, despite his busy schedule, she was allowed to go into the Oval Office and see the president. And he sat down and he said, well, what can I do for you, madam? And she shocked him and she said, nothing. I know that you like cookies and I'm a good cook, so I brought you a batch of my homemade cookies. But here's the cool part of the story. They say that Lincoln got misty-eyed. He said, Madam, everyone who comes to see me comes because they want something or they want to complain about something. You're the first person who has ever come to see me to give me something. Now, I bet you love the leaders in this church. But here's the thing about honor. Honor is not really honor until it is tangibly given. So how can you love above? How can you take the honor that we are to give to our leaders and make that known? They need that because their work is hard, Paul says. I'll tell you one reason why their work is so hard. Look at the very next verse. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. The third way that you love above is you value difficult people. Have you ever noticed that, that some people are harder to love than other people? And if you have not noticed, you are one of those people. It's like the story I heard of a minister who had the first Sunday at 
his new church. So he's going to do a, a children's sermon. He brought all the kids up onto the stage in this particular sanctuary. He had some gorgeous stained glass windows of, of great scenes from Scripture. And he was making a point to the children. He's like, look at those beautiful windows. And, and even though it just shows one scene, each window is made of many, many small panes of glass because it takes many panes of glass to tell this one story. And that's true in the church. So I, I want you to understand that, that you are a little pain and you are a little pain and you are a little pain. And, and he could not understand why everybody was laughing, but the truth of the matter is he was just telling the truth of the matter. Church is full of people who are little pains. And some of them aren't so little. In fact, one of the surest signs that a church is preaching the true gospel is that it attracts people who need extra grace. Don't run from a church like that. Instead, you welcome the opportunity that God is giving you to be enrolled in graduate school anothering. Because how are you going to grow your another muscle if you constantly avoid difficult people? By the way, just remember this. God did not find any of us easy to love. The Bible reminds us in Romans chapter 5 that God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God values us not because we are easy to love, but because in spite of the fact that we can be quite difficult. Jesus says, you love me like I love you. And to take love above the norm, you're going to have to value difficult people. To love as Jesus loved, is to love above the idiosyncrasies that all of us have. To love as Jesus loved is to love above the irritations that other people create for us. In fact, it is to love above the wounds that they have given us. Because if you're going to love above, you have got to learn to express kindness when wronged. There is no other way that distinguishes the another love of Jesus more than this. There is no other way that distinguishes the love of the flesh and the love of the Spirit than our response to hostile people. A couple is in bed and the neighbor's dog in the backyard next door is barking all night. And the man finally throws back the covers and says, I can't take this anymore. And he goes down the stairs, and she hears the door slam. A few minutes later, he comes back in the house, and the dog is still barking. He gets back in bed, and, and she says, what did you do? He says, I got that dog, and I put him in our backyard. Let's see how they like it. And that is the response of the flesh. And the irony is, all we really do when we respond in the flesh is hurt ourselves. So listen to this verse from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 15. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Nothing requires heavyweight loving more than how you respond to a wrong. Wade Boggs is a Hall of Fame baseball player. He began his storied career with the Boston Red Sox, and the one place he hated to play more than anywhere else was Yankee Stadium, not because of the Yankees, but because of their fans. And there was one fan in particular that would come early for every single game and get close to the third baseline where Wade Boggs played and just wear him out game after game with obscenity-laced insults. And one day, Boggs is out there, he's warming up, and the guy just starts in. 
And Boggs walks over to the wall and he says, are you the guy that's always screaming and cursing at me? And the guy stood up and said, yes, I am. What are you going to do about it? Wade Boggs pulls out a brand new baseball, autographs it, and he tosses it to him over the wall and he walks away. And the man never yelled at him again. Now be honest. In your past, there is someone who hurt you. And you've let your love level for that person get static. It hasn't risen because every time you think about them, that wound reminds you of what they did. It is going to take some heavyweight loving to love that person like Jesus loved you, isn't it? You see, that's the thing. Here's what Jesus is asking us to do. He's asking us to raise the bar. Anybody can do lightweight loving, but who's going to love the people who are hurting? Who's going to love the difficult, irritating people? Who's going to love the people that hurt you? I don't know if we can love like this until we become convinced that it is God in us doing the loving. I want you to always remember something. Love above is always replenishable. And to believe that you're going to have to, uh, to believe that you're going to have to believe two different things. First, you're, you're going to have to accept where we started this series that God is absolutely unconditionally loving on you. God loves you above anything that you could imagine. And secondly, you're going to have to go to the only source of unlimited love. So in the same book, Paul says in chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. As a follower of Jesus, as a temple of the Holy Spirit, you have the capacity to another better than anyone else. And God will help you become who your new nature has given you the capacity to be. Because Jesus will not ask you to do the impossible. He asks us to love each other like he loved us. Corey Hahn was well known in high school baseball circles in California. He was Mr. Baseball his senior year. He helped take his team to the state title. He turned down a very lucrative contract right out of high school to play for the Padres and accepted a full ride scholarship to Arizona State. He started as a freshman and in his third game, he was sliding into second base and his neck hit the leg of the opposing player and his neck broke and he was paralyzed from the chest down. The young man that once could throw and now run now struggles to wash his hair, to hold a hamburger. His father, Dale, moved to Tempe, Arizona. He stays in one of these extended stay motels Every day, he gets up, he goes to Corey's room, and he dresses him. After many months, they taught Corey to be able to eat by himself again. He takes him to class, where Corey is able to push himself most of the way in his wheelchair. Not all the way yet. He takes him to cl after class to therapy. After therapy, they either go out and watch a ball game or watch the team practice. And the day winds up with Corey back in his room, hanging out with his friends. And at 11 o'clock, Dale will come back, dress his son for bed, put the television on a timer, and slip out with these words. Good night, buddy. That's not the story that they were expecting but it's the story that they are living. And someone asked Dale how he could just keep doing this. And his answer was profound. When you're a father, you're a father forever. 
There is no other story better than another story. Jesus said, you another better than anyone else. And the world is going to know exactly who you are. We're going to sing a song of invitation this morning. If you've got a decision, why don't you stand up as we make that decision public?